That's fine. No, no, I said they hid it. <laughs> oh, they yeah, it's in like it's in a kebab menu. Uh, I don't know. It's fine. Yeah. We found it. We found the record menu button thing. Oh my god, my brain. Um, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Google Com Google Agones Community Podcast thing. I don't know what I'm doing and where I went back to. Uh, welcome to another week of the Google Cloud Platform Podcast, which I haven't done in about four years. Um, very quickly. Uh, we are joined by wonderful team members from Google, as well as Steven, uh, Steven Shipton. Um, oh God, Steven, I completely forgot the name of the company that you work for. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> <Super solid. laughs> I'm like, trying to introduce guests here. It's terrible. God damn, Mark, get better as a host. Um, uh, cool, cool. Um, Sweet. Um, beautiful. I see Ruby, you're marking stuff up there. What was that last one? Oh, yeah, it's very uh, yes. And then, Robbie, you can go first. Okay. Uh, I just put a note in here. The next release is two weeks away. Um, at our last meeting, we talked about the 1.34 release. Uh, so since then, we've had the 1.35 release uh, and the next release, which is 1.36. I have a note here. It is two weeks away, and I will add the release notes so, for the 1.35 release as well. I'm trying to remember if there was anything particularly exciting in 1.35. Yeah, no, I was having a look. Let's see. Uh, uh, that's blog. Oh, yeah. memory usage bug. And lots of uh, dependency bumps. Yeah, the big one on that it probably should be should be improved memory usage. Yeah. And that's in the Agonis controller, right? Yeah, that is true. That is true. Yes. That should help with those things. What was I going to say? Yes, and this is a note for the next release. We are bumping up our version support. Uh, so if you are running an old version of Kubernetes, uh, something older than 1.26, um, and you want to upgrade, you should upgrade Kubernetes at the same time. Uh, now that we have sort of sliding windows of supporting three versions of Kubernetes per release, it theoretically, uh, if you're near the top end of that window, should give you more time if you'd like to stick on a single Kubernetes version and keep updating uh, Gonas uh, in the meantime. Zach, I stuck your name on the council list one. I wasn't sure if you or Mark added that. But... Both of us did. Mark added it. <laughs> <laughs> but then you updated it. Feel free. I updated, yes. Oh, you oh. updated it. We updated it. Okay, there we go. Uh, I, I can take this one too. So, uh, council list is still progressing. Uh, it's mostly code complete. Uh, EDE tests are still in progress. Uh, and while writing EDE tests, we're fixing some small things in the code. Um, it's not going to be ready in two weeks for the next release. We're aiming for 1.37 um, to flip it on an alpha. Um, and at that point, um, it will not be available in every single SDK. Uh, we'll have it definitely in the Golang SDK, and we'll see if we make it into any others. Uh, we'd love for help adding it to the other SDKs. Uh, and if not, we'll start going through uh, the other SDKs and starting to add support. Um, so yeah, definitely looking forward to that. Um, I know a number of folks are eagerly anticipating the feature so they can start testing. Um, and we expect that that release is when you'll be able to flip a flag to start testing it. That'll be fun. I look forward to that one. Yeah, no, I know a lot of people who are waiting on that. Um, I had the last one. Um, 
Dependabot is having a lot of fun in our repo at the moment. Um, I think the ones that are in there, I'm just having a quick look, they'll probably need some kind of manual intervention rather than uh, just accepting uh, what they've submitted. So for example, like a lot of the example stuff will need to bump the like version number as well as update all the dependencies. Um, Hello, I might. Uh, I think you're reasonably free. I might write up some tickets for you for for some of that some internal stuff um, to take care of that. It's really just updating dependencies and pushing a new version. Um, the nice thing about Dependabot, though, is that more often than not, if you have a PR that fixes those issues, it will close the other ones. So it will automatically close the external PRs. Um, so, uh, like for example, I think I did one where I updated the order scaler webhook because that was driving me nuts. Um, and uh, once that merges, though, it's failing for some reason. I need to look at why. Um, it should I should be able to do the rest. Um, so yeah, Kala, you 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 finished a lot of that stuff. So it looks like you need some more work. Yes. Awesome. Then then I can definitely send that stuff your way. That's it. those are those are easy ones. Yes, please. Awesome, 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 awesome. Um, yeah, and that'll take that should take care of a lot of that stuff too. Come on, Robert, go ahead. Cool. So I just like a note in here. Um, our colleague uh, Ishan will be giving a talk in two weeks uh, at KubeCon North America, uh, where we're going to highlight uh, integration with generative AI and game servers. And I stuck a link to the talk title um, and the, the page on the KubeCon scheduling website. Um, they'll generally upload videos of the talks if you're not at KubeCon within a couple of weeks, maybe a month. Um, and once that video is available, we'll, we'll come back and link it in the next meeting notes so people can, can find it more easily. Um, but if anybody is going to KubeCon, um, please go find Ishan, say hi, um, ask him any questions you have. Um, I think he's the only one from our group that will be there this year. Um, so definitely, definitely find him while you're there. Mark has another conference to talk about. I was muted. That was silly. Um, yeah, just saying. I got. I just got back from the Pragma Backend Services Summit. Um, they're starting a series where they host um, events for specifically backend engineers for uh, games. It was about 100, 120 people. Um, it was really good. Uh, there was definitely some discussion of Agana's usage as well as other like game hosting solutions. Um, but was definitely seeing a, a few places that are definitely using Agana's in a few interesting spots. Uh, I'm trying to think of what I can say publicly. Not entirely sure, so I will not send your names. <laughs> uh, but it's good. It was good. I recommend it. Um, I don't know if I. I. I'm going to go work. I don't know if it, if anyone's watching the recording, there we go, which seems unlikely. But if they are and they are in Australia, I will be in Australia in like December, if that helps anybody. I'm trying to think if there's anything else going on. Yes, if someone is in Australia, they probably are watching the recording. Give them what time. That's, a, that's a fair point. That is a fair point. Um, I don't know how many people actually watch our recordings. I have to go look at our stats. That would be, that would be interesting. Um, anything else anyone wants to talk about? We have an awful lot of outstanding PRs. Um, I know you mentioned Dependabot kind of going crazy, um, which is maybe accounts for half to two thirds of them, it looks like. Yeah. Um, but I think there are, there are some other ones that we should definitely get in as well. Now for... Uh, what's an easy one? Yeah, actually, some of these, uh, like if we, some of these are double ups too. Like if we update all dependencies and say, like the Synodic example, that'll clear out two PRs and republish, basically. Uh, some of these are, are yeah, depend upon very verbose. Oh, that was exciting. My uh, the breaker in my office just tripped. So I just spent the last few minutes trying to 
Got, like now I'm just sitting on my laptop. Um, <laughs> So I noticed Dependabot uh, also has been like spamming branches in GitHub. Like, what's going on with that? It's been spamming or, branches or tags or something. Like, it, it. I did a get fetch, and there was a bunch of like Dependabot related tags that got downloaded. Oh, because Dependabot does it all. Does all its work on. I haven't seen tags, but uh, let's have a look. It, they might be branches. I, I don't know. I saw references. Yeah, they're branches. Dependabot. Okay. Yeah, their branches. It uh, it creates its own work in the same. Uh, yeah, I don't see tags. It creates all the same. It's work in the main upstream repo. So is it just like a suggested fix or something? I haven't yeah. looked at what those yeah, are. Yeah, they're all automated fixes to dependencies. Um, I was Got just it. I was just saying with uh, a lot. It seems like a lot of them are going to require just some manual work on our part. Um, like the examples, for example, if you update the dependencies, you'd want to increment the version number on the example and then republish. Um, so it probably makes sense to do that in one chunk. But the nice thing about Dependabot is it will close those PRs if another PR takes care of it. I see. Yeah, well, we, yeah we've seen that in a couple of places where uh, I think you updated some dependencies as part of one of your PRs, and then it, it closed out some other ones. Oh, that's handy. That's not bad. But yeah, if it as soon as like a vulnerability comes in, like. I catch I catch emails across this and open match and <laughs> a bunch of like many bucks just does that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we just had a, a big Golang one in XNUT and now that, that, probably yeah, I think, what it is. Uh there was that and I think it seems like there's something in GRPC now too. Probably related. But yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> I guess we could talk about the same uh, kind of the topic that I brought up on our internal chat yesterday, which is documenting more integration patterns. Love it. Like, I'd love to hear. Um, there's there's some things that are uh, like that are website documents that are not. Uh, completely intuitive as to how to actually pull off uh, like in production. Um, so one of those was, uh, as an example, was that I brought up yesterday was the high density game servers. I love the sequence diagram. I love showing that it was kind of a feasible thing, but like actually seeing a worked example of, uh, you know, running kind of multiple rooms in the same game server, or even an example that had like, you know, multiple containers running uh mm. different game servers like and kind of like a quick start kind of that. scenario yeah exactly like even mm. just I dig it. showing it with simple game server is like here's simple game server you know running with four can four simple game server containers per like agones container and how you can set up the counts and lists and allocator and everything to do yep. the right thing um because I noticed, uh, I've been seeing a couple of cases recently where we've had, uh, let's call them reliability issues around uh, higher pod churn rates. And like I've been kind of eyeing like what it means to uh, to change our pattern so that it doesn't do that as much. Uh, um, and, you know, it's a question of like, do we fight against the more dominant patterns on Kubernetes, or do we uh, like try to to kind of play nicer in that ecosystem too? So, no, uh, more docs always better. Um, yeah, we can work something out. I wonder if we can turn. Simple game server into a like a multi-tenant simple game server or something. Well, I was wondering if there's a pattern we because it, it, it seemed like we could have homogeneous slots of containers and maybe support that in first class, uh, as sort of first class like virtual rooms within a game server or something of that nature. Oh, doing it like a pod per game server. No, like a container oh, pod, per game yeah. server within the 
within the game server pod. I guess so, the, the terminology it gets really yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I'd like to go back to our users on that, but my guess is that if they go multi tenant, it's a single process for a reason because then they can share memory. Yes. Um, so multi container, while it does solve some, that's an interesting one. It might solve some churn issues. Um, it may not necessarily solve the multi tenant issue when they're going multi tenant, if that makes sense. But it may be an interesting interim step. It offers a, a possibly deployment. Uh, Denser deployment, yes. It, it offers some, yeah, a denser deployment at the uh, with the advantage of possibly just uh, not changing the binary in theory, although maybe in theory. Like, yeah, there it's an interesting idea. Yeah, I, I see the reasoning. Yeah, I see the reasoning. Because there are other advantages for denser deployments, like just having bigger pods uh, is yep. a little easier to deal with. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But flip side. You have to figure out what internal fragmentation looks like at that point, because like right yep. now we don't have an issue. But like you know, if you you know take it to the limit and say you have ten containers each running a game server, how do you handle the fact that all nine of them are unoccupied? Yep. Like, then you're paying for uh, for those. And you're counting. You're counting rooms in twenty by room. Um, what was I going to say? We can already do port management to multiple containers. That's a thing we right. already do. I'm pretty sure. Um, I think right now port like port management on allocation, if that makes sense, is kind of a um if you had a multiple container or even multi-tenant, how you assign how you know which port is the right port to talk to is kind of a uh, exercise for the reader at this point in time. If that, that makes sense. And that's actually what I kind of wanted a, a documented solution for too, because I couldn't figure out that. I, that was an aspect I couldn't figure out from looking at the counts and list. Yeah, like, and one of those things is it depends because they may just be like, if it's a big monolithic like chunk of application, they'll be like, we have one port. And part of which room you go to is part of your connection string. And that's just all handled by the game server. And the guy isn't going to care. Um, other solutions might be, we have separate ports uh, for each room inside the system. Um, and we need to pre-allocate those, which is probably the path of most resistance. <laughs> um, just because if you have 100 rooms and you need 100 ports, and that's just, we don't, we don't support that beautifully yeah. right now. Um, and that might be the reason why the kind of yeah. high density, or rather the <laughs> medium density, let's call it, where you have multiple containers in the game yeah. server is not as easy because you have to figure out that port allocation too. There is that. And then you can potentially also run into um, just run out of ports on a machine as you start getting into really high volumes of, say, like relays or something like that, too. Or That's that fair. Kind of stuff, which is also a contributing factor, uh, especially if you're yeah, working out where your port range is on your machine and how many ports you want to have open, um, which is another fun problem. Um, which I yeah so that's a that's a potentially interesting question for research as well but I think I think you're absolutely right we can start we should we should build out some examples for that kind of stuff that'd be my thoughts um, and this is also why we go through alphas so that people will tell us what our stuff is working and how it can be better yeah agreed it would be. Some of this was inspired by um, getting into a little product side for us, but like some of this was inspired by the the way autopilot discretizes uh, billing as well. So in the case of like a small game server, um, you might actually want to pack multiple game servers into a pod, Makes or sense. figure out or figure out the multi-tenant model. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, if the if the user is willing to figure out the multi-tenant model, that's probably the better way to actually just make the pods make the game server bigger. Um, but of course, it has like a blast radius and security and blah 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 issue. So yeah, yeah, we should uh, we should work out which models are the priority of the people who use this, like of people. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's an interesting one though, for sure. Because there is, I totally get it. Like if you were like, hey, as an easy thing, just add more containers and that'll like get you maybe over a hump, like in some sort of performance or, or throughput or like that. And then maybe later you turn into something multi-tenant if you absolutely have to. Um, and again, depending on session length and churn and all that kind of fun stuff. So yeah, no, those are all good ideas. I mean, some of it is, I mean, for port management, some of it could just be as simple as you have names on each port. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have a count, it goes blah, 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 blah. And when you allocate, you increment the count. You go, I'm on room number five, which means I'm on port number five, and boom, away I go. Right. That's, that's the super easy solution. Um, good thing about that is it's also atomic. <laughs> Which is nice. Steven, you've been very quiet. You're sitting in the background. I have You're to right. drop for another meeting, but it was good to chat with everybody this morning. And Sweet. I will see you guys at our next monthly meeting. See you later, Robbie. Is there anything you yeah. want to talk about, Steven? No. Um, yeah, just looking at that. I think we've got some, I saw that the ticket's making progress to the new uh, SDK uh, functions. So yeah, I'm ready to jump on uh, any Node.js. So. Oh, sweet. <laughs> You're a delight. Brilliant. We had something recently. I can't remember. Uh, I think it was a dependency update. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think is what that was. Um, hey, that's what I was looking for. Uh, Hello, is there anything that you wanted to talk about? I'm good. You're good. I'm making you some tickets right now for a couple of at least easy ones. Uh, right. um, I have two things. So uh, PRs, right? I'll share the link. Uh, it is taking uh, two, um, more than three hours. Like all PRs? Um, yesterday, I I have merged a uh, uh, feature branch with main branch. Uh, it took three uh, three and a half hours. Yeah, depending on how big our queue is, it could happen. Where is that spending its time? Um, uh, will it be because of a uh, recent update? Uh, sorry, Kubernetes version update. Where's that? Wait to become leader for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that the wait to become leader stuff, um, the uh, I changed it. I don't know how many months ago at this point. Um, basically, all the builds kind of line up in a queue to run E to E tests. So uh, the they look and see like which build is uh, the active build and. If it's if they aren't the the uh, the old if they aren't the oldest E to E build that's running, um, they just sit there waiting until they are the oldest E to E build that's running, and then they run E to E's. Uh, it's basically a mutex for the E to E clusters. Um, but if you see time accumulating in that step, it means that there, in theory, were other PRs. In practice, it could also mean that the, the queuing system is broken. Like we might have, uh, we might have, you know, other builds that were uh, getting, like that it was waiting behind for some reason. Um, concretely, the the output for that step has the uh, build IDs of what it was waiting for. So the twenty sixth step will be waiting for uh, to get active. Is that correct? Uh, for me, it's step twenty four. It's called EDE wait to become leader on that on that link. Oh, okay. Uh, and you'll see the output is like yeah. waiting to become oldest running build, and then it says oldest is. Um, it looks like the build 
Looks like when it first came in, it took like two or three minutes for the next build. And then uh, this next one. Yeah, end to ends take about an hour. So started at 2206 and finished at 2253. The one after that finished at 2250 or started at 2254. Yeah, these look like EDEs. I'd have to go double check. They would be, yeah, probably. I, yeah, I mean, there's a chance that I did something dumb with the, the build filter. Well, <laughs> yeah. Also, yesterday we got a slew of Dependabot PRs, which mm -hmm. all would have then oh. kicked off end-to-end uh, -end yeah. tests, and kicking off end-to-end -end tests means that there's a longer queue, and because there's a longer queue, then PRs take longer, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, yeah. This um, is the one... good, the good, yeah, go on. This is one area where Prow, or at least I think it's Boscos, is the part of Prow that like lets you kind of check in and check out whole infrastructures. Mm. Uh, this is the part of Prow that, that that it does really well at, which is actually like parallelized uh, build and like management of of that part. Um, you know, what I did was a a super hacky way to try to keep the, <laughs> the builds fair and in order. Uh, but it, it occasionally, it, I think it's actually been, I think the build throughput has been better than it was when a year yeah. ago. Uh, I would agree with that. And I think the, um, the other nice thing is that now we've got the merge, like we've got um, auto merge and the auto update stuff. If you've got a thing that's approved and it's auto merged and there's at least a PR in flight that's been approved that's up to date, then you can just leave your PR alone and it'll just automatically update. And you can just be like, all right, cool. I'll worry about that when it gets updated and I'll go do something else. And I don't have to worry about it. Yep. The system kind of takes care of itself. So even while we're sleeping, it can it can merge PRs. Yeah. Um, and and to, and in fact, to that point, um, going and going back to your PR and constantly hitting update is just going to slow up the process. Because it'll end up back of the line. It'll end up back, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's there's actually, yeah, just trust the automation. <laughs> to a degree, anyway. Well, the, the, that queue, the EEQ, certainly doesn't prioritize. Like, it could be smarter about prioritizing, like, oh, this PR is, you know. Approved, so let that like, one in first. Yeah, or something like that. Like, there's definitely improvements that could be made there. And some, uh, I've seen some really fancy CIs that actually do try to prioritize like between kind of pre pre approve and pre. Oh, fun! Yeah, it, I don't know. I still need to write that doc about moving uh, us over to proper GitHub. Yeah, uh, yeah. GitHub integrations. I just keep putting it to the. It's like, <laughs> like uh, things work. I can't be bothered fixing them. Um, so, but I should uh, feel free to hassle me at some point if that's the thing that needs to happen or we start really wanting that. It does do two things that are actually really nice. One, it now can send cloud build logs directly to like the actions page on GitHub. So you don't have to be part of the Google group to see the output of CI. Um, which is actually kind of nice. Um, and you can hit retry on the GitHub page and it goes all the way through without having to go to the actual cloud build page as well. I think, uh, maybe we just set up a uh, cloud scheduler thing to uh, delete the sync VM in like three months. And, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't, and if it goes off without uh, us doing yeah. anything about it, then uh, we'll be surprised. There's there's one thing the sync VM, actually, I should probably, what I probably should do is write a doc for all, A, all the stuff the sync VM actually does. <laughs> um, and the uh, and a plan therein um, because the sync VM. So the sync VM used to do cleanup of images, like build images, which I don't think it does anymore. I don't remember if we have. We I think I think we can now do time. I have to go look at whether on artifact registry you can be like if this image is thirty days or older, get rid of it. I think I think we can do that now. Um, I'd have to look. Um, it also does cleanup of App Engine versions. So once a night, it'll actually shrink it down to like. 20 or 30 because that that has like a maximum of like a few hundred and if you hit it then you just can't deploy anymore per service um so especially on previews and stuff like that like it's it's like scaled it back um that could all get pulled into 
a cloud function or whatever that's actually running on a cron rather than yeah rather than a it's a little bash screen that's running on a cron on a vm because <laughs> that was the easiest thing to do at the time with yeah the i mean functions. if you want to write out like these are the independent pieces of the sync vm and we could just start peeling off like off those bits yeah it's a really yeah because like that one sounds like you said like something we could just dump into a, a cloud scheduler yeah. you know yeah set up a service account do that kind of stuff yeah and now those would be relatively minor the, yeah. the, i think the, and then we just have to figure out the get one which is yeah fun yeah that's that's a day of just sitting down and doing it yeah i agree but I don't know what all the sync VM does right now. You know, I, so it's fine. <laughs> Try it down. I've logged into it before to poke at it and reset it. But <laughs> beautiful. It is. It it feels like the uh, load bearing poster. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, here we go. Oh, there's a bugginizer issue. Um, I will make a note on that issue as well. Um. I'll say as part of this work, also include what other responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah. I will write that on the ticket so that I remember. Um, as an interesting part, I don't know if you saw the conversation on counts and lists with uh, Eric Fortan on the the issue. Um, which was an interesting, I thought it was just an interesting conversation, just that uh, he was asking about like what happens with the webhook autoscaler and counts and lists. Uh, and something that wasn't particularly well explained in there, but we kind of just get for free, which is what's kind of the nice idea with this, or the way I think I think it was nicely designed in the first place if I used it myself. Um, is because the fleet status gets passed over to the webhook autoscaler. Um, any additions to the fleet status uh, is automatically. Uh, in included in so into the webhook autoscaler. So we actually get counts and lists on the webhook autoscaler without having to do any work, which is nice. As long as, because we have the aggregate functions there, it'll all come through as like, this is how much capacity you have, this is how much allocated you have. It's all there, so you can make your own calculations as neatly. So I thought that was neat. <laughs> Cool. I don't have anything else. Do y'all have anything else? Um, you have uh, um, uh, responded to a user uh, regarding that uh, internal uh, 500 uh, error. So can you please check that? Yeah. I did. They were getting, I, I need, that's actually something I want to look at. Yeah, I know exactly the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think they responded to my question um actually playing with the allocator is something that is on my long list of things to look at um because i can't remember what like http codes it returns for what and whether and like how that works like if if like say for example you don't have any game servers, like what's the code that comes back, and like that kind of stuff. Um, I have a feeling some, there might be some bad design decisions in there and like that I may have put in there. Um, so I can't remember why, he, the, he, I can't remember if there may just be, you may just get a 500. He may be getting a 500 because of contention. Um, that's a thing that might be happening, like something like if there's a lot of data going through, um, but I just want to see what the 500, if there's a body with a 500 error so that you'll actually see a, a log of some kind or return type of some kind or some, something like a JSON packet, something. Um, but the impetus for that is also if we get the HTTP statuses right for various errors that we might have in the HTTP thing, that means that we can actually start doing some cool things with service meshes. Um, uh, which I think is going to be re is really good for multi cluster stuff. If that makes sense. So if there's a particular, say for example, HTTP status for hey, there's no more game servers here, you could then tell like a service mesh, hey, don't send any traffic to this cluster for a while because there's no point. Um, 
and we can do stuff like you can do short circuiting and stuff. So um, they haven't responded. So I don't know what the deal is with that. So we will ask for the logs. I asked them like, so they're getting a 500, but there should there probably is still a body to the return from the HTTP. So there's probably a JSON packet. Mm -hmm. um that has some sort of explainer about like why it's it's erroring and so i want that is kind of that was what i was asking for there okay um also it was a goddess's birthday the other day that is also a good point Yay. <laughs> forget how old we are uh and with the first commit on Agonis, I'm trying to remember. The calendar says October 22nd. I'm trying to remember the year, actually. Nice. Um, <laughs> 2015? Yeah. Same here. It was 2015. I think you're right. Log reverse. 2017. Back when we thought we were going to call it Aegon. Aegon. Oh. <laughs> Sunday the 22nd. Did I do it on a Sunday? Yeah, that sounds like me. That sounds exactly like me. Especially back then. Aww. Aww. Update to go 1.9.2. It's commit. <laughs> you grew up so fast. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, if there's nothing else, I'll let you all go. Uh, so you'll be creating a ticket for me. Already have two for you. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you. No worries. All right. Catch you all later. Bye. Thank you.